Good morning and welcome. We're delighted to have you here with us this morning to further look at future planning for people with intellectual disability. This is our third post-school options uh, webinar. Today, we are going to look at uh, employment. Uh, how do I find employment? And how do I find supports uh, for employment? It's going to be a snapshot given that we're only an hour today and we're going to be tested as we have fabulous presenters today and we may likely have many questions uh, for them. However, if the questions get beyond our capacity today, know that we will take note of them and we will make every effort to get back to you and to address the questions. We found in our past two webinars that many people engaged uh, with uh, questions that we uh, were delighted to see and excited to uh, begin to engage further uh, to provide information. Just so you know, this event will be recorded. It will be recorded and placed on the Inclusion Ireland uh, YouTube site. And as soon as that is ready, uh, you can log on to Inclusion Ireland and find it in that location. We also will be publishing by next week a web page on our Inclusion Ireland website called Post School Options. And all our videos from this webinar series can be found in that location. Throughout this morning, if you would use the Q&A uh, at the bottom of your screen, uh, we will um, be taking questions throughout and we will have two opportunities after our first uh, speakers and then after our, our next panel of speakers uh, to address your questions. This event is uh, funded uh, through the Leash and Offley uh, Children and Young People Services uh, Committee. It's been three years in the making and it's through consultation and many conversations that it was identified that there was a need for information in particular for family members and individuals with intellectual disability to know what third level op options uh, exist uh, throughout Ireland. So a steering committee was formed and with this particular outcome, I'd like to thank the individuals who were involved in that effort uh, from the Leash and Offley area. And in, in particular, I uh, thank Healthy Ireland uh, for their funding for this event today, uh, noting how important it is that the information gets shared and organized in a, a fashion that can be accessed um, by all people. Uh, as I said, we're hoping to provide a snapshot and overview of possibilities. And the hope is by the end of this hour that you, uh, either a person with decisions to make uh, or a family member uh, may have more of an idea how to uh, plan for your future. On the screen, you can see we uh, have just launched a poll. If you would take a few moments and, um, and uh, look at the poll, uh, populate your answers. Um, just so you know, Inclusion Ireland, uh, we are a membership-led organization. Uh, we work to advance the human rights of persons with intellectual disability. Uh, our platform is the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disability. And it's the voice of the person with disability, family members that drives our work. And we invite you, if you have not already, to join us in this work by becoming uh, a member. We'll take uh, another minute here. Uh, we have over a hundred uh, people involved in this uh, webinar this morning, and uh, we're close to a hundred now of uh, people who voted. This will give us an idea of where, um, who, who's participating today, where you're from, and what you see as a primary concern when we look at post-school options.
Okay, we'll go ahead and end our polling and look at our results. Uh, our results today are, we have about 4% of our participants are people with intellectual disability. Our primary participants today are family members at 44%. Next, we have professionals in a disability service at 34%, other professionals around 16%. Most of our participants today come from Leinster at about 70%, uh, Munster 16%, Connick 12%, and Ulster is 2%. And the most important question this morning is the biggest concern uh, that people have with post-school options. Uh, the number one concern is limited options at 40, 47%, lack of guidance at 31%, lack of supports at 19%, and cost at 3%. So without uh, further ado, I would like to invite uh, Marie and uh, Mark to turn on your cameras, please. Lovely to see you this morning. morning. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to just briefly introduce Marie and Mark and I'm gonna then step off the stage and uh, allow them um, to take uh, the main, main stage here. So Marie is the Pathways Coordinator in the Trinity Center for People with Intellectual Disabilities in Trinity College. Marie is responsible uh, for building the Business Partners Network and securing both financial and practical support from the business community. She works closely with the business partners to develop work placements paid internships and employment opportunities for students and graduates of the program. Uh, Marie's background is uh, she has an honors degree in French and Italian from UCD and postgraduate in business studies uh, from the Michael Smurfett Graduate School of Business. She brings 20 years of experience um, to this pathway coordinator's role, primarily in business development, product development, and marketing and consumer relationship management. Mark is from Dunamade in Dublin, ringing in from sunny Dunamade. Uh, he is a young man with Down syndrome who's a graduate uh, of the Certificate in Art Science and Inclusive uh, Applied Practice from Trinity uh, College Dublin. Mark completed a work placement and graduate internship uh, in uh, EY, and he'll be telling us a little more about his work at EY here soon in Dublin uh, in 2018. It was offered a, a permanent contract with EY in 2019. Uh, thank you, Marie and Mark, for being with us here this morning. Thank you so much, Patria. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen, um, get started. So thank you so much for inviting myself and Mark to present to you all here today. Um, we're delighted to have the opportunity to talk to you. So um, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about the uh, Trinity Centre for people with intellectual disabilities, but in particular our graduate internship programme. So I know my colleague Des was uh, speaking last week, uh, but just to give you a bit of a summary, we run a two year certificate programme for students with intellectual disabilities um, based within the School of Education in Trinity College in Dublin. There's Mark with his classmates on his graduation day um, in the picture. So we have a wide range of uh, modules over the two years. And the idea is just to give a broad education to our students. Um, so the reason we're here today is to tell you about our graduate internship um, or our pathways into employment program. So the only, the only way we can run this program is thanks to the wonderful partnerships that we have with businesses uh, uh, throughout uh, Dublin and beyond. Um, our goal, the goal um, that we have is about real inclusion and meaningful jobs. Um, and what we do is we focus always on the ability of individuals, um, focus on their goals and their strengths and work together to ensure that we can um, support uh, our graduates to, to achieve their goals and to, uh, to develop their, their potential. So as I mentioned, we work with uh, uh, fantastic business partners who provide us with lots of supports. So there is financial support in um, the form of an annual uh, contribution. 
uh, student work placements, graduate internships, training workshops, guest lectures, and ultimately employment. So I have two, I have two slides with all our lovely colorful logos of the partners. Um, and it's just to give you an idea of the range of partners that we have. Um, so as you can see, we work with um, law firms, uh, banks and financial institutions. There's aircraft leasing firms. Um, there's large multinationals you'll see there like PayPal and Intel. Um, there's uh, just such a wide range of companies. And the great thing about this is it, that it allows us to provide real choice for um, our graduates and to kind of, you know, give them the opportunity to see different industries and to, you know, get a feel for different type of, of office environments and, um, and see where they might like to work ultimately. So our student work placements run each year between February and April. Um, the students do one morning per week um, for a period of eight weeks. And the idea of this is just to give an introduction to the workplace um, and to give them a sense of what it's like to be to be in an office environment. Um, now, obviously, this year, due to COVID, um, we had to rethink everything. So our poor students didn't get a chance to be on site in the companies, but they did. Um, they did do a kind of virtual work placement. So they still had their work placement on Friday mornings, but unfortunately it was over Zoom instead of in an office. Um, so the, the feedback is that, you know, even though it wasn't the same, it was still a fantastic opportunity and a great learning experience for the students and they all really, really enjoyed it. So our graduate internship program, um, we, we um, work with businesses who provide uh, three or six month paid internships to start with. Um, and the, the aim is to develop key employment skills. So our graduates work up to about 20 hours a week. And we work with both the graduate and the company to see what, what format this um, the hours might take. So some prefer to work um, all mornings and others might provide, uh, prefer to do two full days. Um, others again might only want to do you know, one morning a week due to other commitments. So we work, we work to kind of find uh, the best uh, situation for everybody involved. And the, um, the fantastic thing is that the, the graduates are supported by mentors within the business itself. So these are volunteer mentors who work very closely with our graduates to really support them and help them to feel included. So our internship program is running uh, only since uh, 2017. So it's relatively new. Um, and the key to the success of the program is significant advance planning. And um, so we have lots and lots and lots of meetings with, um, with the business partners in advance of any internship starting. We, we develop a really close collaboration with companies and it's really important that we have a relationship of trust where they feel that you know, they can ask us anything, they can call us at any time for support and, uh, and that there is a, you know, a real clear communication channels. So we have um, occupational therapy framework, which guides all of the processes um, all the way through college uh, and leading into uh, the internships afterwards. And that is really, really important. So my colleagues, Barbara and Iara, um, have a full occupational therapy program that runs from the minute the students start in Trinity and then leads ultimately into uh, life beyond college, whether that's internships or further education. And we provide ongoing support. So before, during and after each internship, we, we're there to support. So some sample roles really, really quickly, just to kind of give you an idea of some of the, the things that our graduates have done uh, in the past in companies. So we have a lot of graduates who've uh, worked in reception roles um, others who've done events and marketing. So like conferences or events such as today, um, where there's a lot of preparation work in advance, a lot of uh, tasks that need to be done on the day with guest lists, um, information packs and that kind of thing. Um, we have others who like computers and are very strong with IT skills. So they might like kind of data entry jobs. Um, and then general administration and facilities could be anything from working in HR teams, um, supplies for the office, post within the office, um, organizing interviews, lots of different types of tasks. And what we do is we work very closely with the companies to come up with ideas for tasks and for roles um, with them uh, that will best suit each individual person. So um, huge benefits obviously for the graduates with increased confidence, uh, transferable skills and, and references and experience for their CV. 
but ultimately it's about making them feel included and giving them a sense of belonging um, within the company. But the benefits for employers are immense as well. So, you know, these employers now have a new pool of talent to draw on. Um, it, it, it helps create a, a real uh, improved morale within the company and a really inclusive workplace. Uh, and the feedback has been just nothing but positive since we've started. So since the programme started in 2017, we've had uh, 12 permanent roles already um, in, in the companies that you see here. And uh, many of them have, um, have hired a number of our graduates and offered permanent roles. But in addition to these um, permanent roles, we also have a large number of our graduates uh, on long term internships. So we hope that we'll have more permanent roles over the coming months and years. Um, and on that note, I'm going to introduce our fantastic graduate, Mark Hogan, who is with me today. Um, so Mark is a graduate of our programme um, and now also a permanent employee in EY. And I'm going to hand over to Mark. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to let Mark tell you his story. So just uh, I'll share the screen here for Mark and hand over. There you go. Oh, sorry. My name is Mark Hogan and I have a disability called Down syndrome. I am from Donald Dublin, Ireland. In January 2019, I graduated from a two-year course with Trinity Centre for People with Intellectual Disability in Arts, Science and Inclusive Employee Practice. I am now a permanent employee in EY Dublin. My BFF and his mom recommended the TCPID in Art, Science and Inclusive Applied Practice to me and my mom. I went down to UT. CPID to apply in 2015, but they took me in 2016 instead of 2015, and I was happy to get in. It was a two year course. I undertook a lot of classes. Best and favorite classes were science, math, sports, Irish sign language, modern art. Disability rights, human rights, a time for beginners, work placement, and, and science fest, which I did a project called Guinness is Good for You. On the 25th of January in 2019, I graduated from a two year course with Trinity Centre for People with Intellectual Disability. Um, here's some pictures that I graduated from the TCPID. EY stands for Honest and Union. At first, I undertook an eight week work placement with EY in February 2018 as part of the TCPID's work placement program. I followed that up with a three month internship with EY in June 2018, which was extended out to the end of March of 2019. I was made permanent in April of 2019, and my role in EY is a staff assistant with the ETC Global Trade Team. Um, here are some pictures of when I'm with my boss Neil, with my intern, with my um certificate, and one of my business challenge. On getting the news, was I was being made permanent at EY. I really felt happy and proud and also excited when I heard the new, the good news. Since I was a kid, I really wanted to 
walk in an office, and my dream came true. I am happy to be in EY. I told my mom, my sister Susan, also my dad, even my nephew and godson. But most importantly, I told my nanny O'Callaghan, and she was very happy for me that I got into EY. I really enjoy working very hard in EY. And I do a lot of different types of projects in my daily role. Some of my tasks were researching and preparing the weekly eCube project for my team. Um, I monitor and issues Google trailers to team members. I also do meeting room bookings calendar invoice, filing, travel research, and other side projects. I also would like to attend EY events and social days out as well. I have attended EY's Better Begins with You Awards in London, the CIPD Awards in Dublin, and Global Trade Life size event in Dublin and many team meetings. I especially like working with my fellow colleagues as a part of a team. I learned how to set up Google Alerts to monitor for important developments in tariff, trade walls, and Brexit. I use this information to keep my team informed about any updates in these areas. As part of the EY Interns Business Challenge, which I undertook alongside my fellow interns, I learned about how to develop an invitation box as our team challenge. And, and we got through to the final in my first year at EY. I also learned from my mentor, Paula, about to organize an important paperwork, create EY biogs, and help to build an organization chart and email distribution list for my team, which I did using my computer skills. When I was younger, my main goal was to work in an office. As all thanks to Trinity College and EY, my dream job came true. My goal in the future is firstly is to continue progressing and enjoying my career in, in EY Dublin. I would also like to travel around the world for business with EY and to become a manager, director or partner someday. I wish I can talk to all partners us in EY, even EY CEO, about what work young people with disabilities can do in EY, because we have to be equal and show respect to people, about those who have a disability and those who don't. I would like I would also like to continue to presentations and speak up in public on different ways to build a better working world. And I am grateful for oh, events as this where I can share my talk with you on this topic. So thank you for inviting me to speak here today, representing people with Down syndrome and disabilities. Thank you. Mark, that was fabulous. Marie, thank you. Mark, uh, we have a number of questions. Are you ready? It's me. <laughs> <laughs> of course. People are very enthused. 
uh, by your experience and your contribution today. Uh, our first question, Mark, is how do you think uh, you have changed since you started your studies in Trinity College in 2016? I actually changed a lot but when I was in Trinity College, to be honest, and I put in a lot of effort in my studies is, is to, is for my classes. Is, and now I am fully confident in, in myself. That's fabulous to hear. Your enthusiasm is infectious. <laughs> you sound like a fabulous advocate, Mark. Uh, Thank you. What do you enjoy most about your work with EY? I really enjoy it working very hard alongside my work colleagues. It's, I'm going into EY's big events and social events also. And how did EY support you and make you feel included when you first started working there? Um, they supported me by giving me a mentor. And her name is Paula Pigman. And even my boss, Neil, oh, and my counselor, Kieran Bean, also oh, supported me as well. Oh, oh, and they included me in everything. Mm. That's, that's fabulous to hear. Fabulous. Now, this next question, I'm not sure, if Mark, you want to take this or Marie. Uh, but one of our attendees, one of our participants has asked about the disability allowance and how that's impacted um, in yeah. terms of work and hours. Yeah, so the way we, we work with that is that that's why the 20 hours kind of um, per week is, is where we kind of figure that out. So um, we would, each employer has a different um, salary that they would offer. Obviously, we don't get involved in that side of it. We just provide guidance of the cap, I suppose, the maximum that is allowable to earn without it impacting too much on the disability allowance. So, you know, families are involved in that as well, that if they feel maybe if they reduce their hours slightly, then it won't impact on the disability allowance so much. But that, that's kind of negotiated with the company and the employment contract. And uh, what we don't want is for people to be negatively impacted by, um, by working. So we definitely take that into consideration and work with each employer to make sure that they're aware of it and that the families and that the individual themselves are happy. Something to keep an eye on. Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, most of our questions um, aren't questions at all. Uh, they're compliments. <laughs> saying super job, Mark, well done. You're an inspiration. Uh, you give me hope. Such a transformational life-changing uh, engagement for both students and employers. A brilliant presentation. Uh, congratulations um, on your studies and success at EY. Uh, so lots of applause coming in here. Uh, thank you for sharing your experience. EY is lucky to have such a loyal employee. Uh, it's great to hear your confidence, Mark. That's one of the uh, compliments here. Um, are you full-time, Mark? Y yes, I actually am full-time. Um, like um, because um, technically my role now is actually a staff assistant there in, in EY. So yes, it is a full one. Full-time. Okay, and then a technical question in terms of the work placements. Uh, Marie, uh, is it office-based work placements only? So uh, we, we have a range of companies. They are mainly office-based uh, roles. So, but within that, I mean, there's lots of different types of roles within each company. So even for example, if it is a law firm, a law firm will have, you know, a catering part, they will have HR, they will have facilities. So within each business, there's lots of choice. Um, they are mainly currently office based um, because I suppose that's what our partners uh, are currently. But uh, we try and provide as much choice as we can. Are the companies outside of Dublin, uh, Marie? Yeah, so we have um, we have kind of within the uh, surrounding areas as well. So, for example, we have um, one graduate who's working in uh, PayPal in Dundalk. We have um, Kildare. Uh, we have we have companies that have bases in, in other parts of the country. For example, we have another graduate working in EY in Cork. 
Um, so he did come to Dublin to do the course and then is, is back in Cork. So we were able to facilitate, well, EY were able to facilitate um, an internship for him in Cork. So as I said, it's, it's mainly the Leinster region, but a lot of our companies will be um, throughout the country as well. Thank you. Uh, amazing, Mark. Uh, Laura and Rebecca are here in Prosper Fingal listening to you. And there's a query here too for you, Mark, about working at home and what's that been like? Well, I fall to three times in, in but I actually got used to it right, because of, of, I really, it's, um, it's really easy to work from home um, as well, even working from the office. Nice. And Marie, do you know if there are similar outreach or programs in rural areas? So we are, I know Des, my colleague Des spoke last week about the um, INHEF uh, forum, which is looking at similar programs throughout the country. So um, we can share the, the email address or the website address for that, which is inhef.ie. So there are other programs um, throughout the country, uh, some similar to ours, some, you know, bespoke to the local um, area, but it is, we're hoping to make it more commonplace. So we are helping other um, colleges and universities to to develop similar um, similar programs. So hopefully it will be um, very commonplace throughout the country very soon. One final question. I apologize participants, we haven't gotten to all of them. But one final question is in terms of the balance, um, perhaps Marie or Mark, uh, either of you could address this in terms of uh, academic uh, or personal development. Is there a balance in the course? So the course is, is, has a lot of um, modules. So the, the, it is two years full time, there's 22 modules. So there is a balance in, in that, you know, there's a, there's a significant occupational therapy um, part of the program, which runs for the full two years of the program, which works with each individual, both so in groups and one to one, where they develop um, goals and strengths and and uh, techniques and and there's a whole framework guiding that principle and there is a lot of actual academic stuff um, as well so um, the students have a, a variety of of subjects and and it kind of suits the the broad education the broad interests uh, but it, there is a balance between the two um, and from day one there's the occupational therapy framework that guides everything and um, it mixed in with the academic as well. Great. Yeah, yeah, even even also it's um you know like um like um I, I balance my education with my life if and my work okay as all balance between all them if, if you know what I mean because I do a lot or other activities is outside of the education and work. Oh, if you know what I mean, but yeah, it's, it's all coming to balance with that. Lovely. Well, you can't hear the applause, but there's <laughs> there's applause of 152 attendees uh, behind the screen. So I want to thank you so much for your time. And uh, if there's time at the end, I will bring you back on because it's likely you, we may have more questions. Thank Bye. you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Okay. So as we transition here, I'd like to invite our next uh, speakers, please. Um, Des Henry, Killian Keating, and Scott Mates to please uh, join us. Uh, we're, we're moving into looking at um, the WALK program. Des Henry is the Careers and Employment Coordinator in WALK, and he leads the supported transition and employment programs across the organization. So following a, a career in business over 18 years, uh, he managed a highly successful labor market activation project, supporting early school leavers to retrain, upskill, and gain employment and progress in further education. Des brings his business training and employability experience to the issue of employment to people with disabilities. And his mission is to facilitate individuals to overcome barriers by opening doors to employment that give people more choices in life. Uh, Scott is a young man who attended uh, school Aaron Owen, excuse me, in Crumlin, uh, Dublin 12, and now works in Regatta Great Actors 
uh, while studying QQI level five. Uh, he is a soccer coach and gym instructor in Pierce College. And Killian Keating, a young man who now works at Facebook in, well, at home, right, Killian? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but for Facebook at the IT help desk and attended St. Augustine's School in Black Rock County, Dublin. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being with us yeah. this morning. And please take center stage. Dad, you forgot to change it <laughs> to where Scott goes to school. I know. I, I knew. I knew somebody was going to pull me up on that one, Killian. <laughs> uh, good. Good morning, everybody. Can, uh, can you see the screen? Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, good morning. I'm going to start by apologising to Scott because I, I got his school oh, right. wrong when I sent that into Patria, but uh, I, 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 I thought I'd get away with it, but Killian's after reminding me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm going to just, um, let me just start, just a little bit of a conversation from, um, just maybe to start with a little bit about walk and and our side of it before I let uh, Scott and Killian unleash their, their life stories on everybody. Um, they, they could go on all day, so we might have to stop them in a while, Patria, okay? But uh, just to start, Walk is an organisation which supports people with intellectual disabilities and autism to live self-determined lives. So doing ordinary things in ordinary places is really the standard that we set. So for any of the, the, the young people on the call today, um, it's about life after school. What do you want to do after school? Doing ordinary things like going to college, getting a job, developing a career. These are all really important things for us. Uh, we believe there's a place in the world for everybody. And a big part of this transition process and leaving school is about finding your best place. And a lot of that involves... Um, you know, figuring out who you are, what you like, what you're good at, and where you might best fit in in the world, and then helping the people that you would encounter to help you to be included and fit in as well. So we, we spend a lot of time on that. And this is not easy, but uh, sometimes we make it a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. And a lot of the time we find people probably start maybe in the wrong place as well. So a little bit on maybe how we do that in WALK. Uh, we have two supported employment-based uh, programs. Uh, both of them are funded currently through the Ability Program, uh, because as we know, uh, WALK is a disability service provider. A lot of the funding, or the majority of funding comes from the HSE, uh, who don't fund employment or, or going to college. So we have found a way to bring the skills needed to help young people transition to these mainstream options and employment uh, by going outside of the system. So, uh, for example, our, our Walk Peer Ability project, um, this is the fourth time we've piloted this same project and uh, the Ability Program funding is finishing at the end of August. So we're now back in the cycle of looking for more funding to keep it going. Um, it's interesting to see in the poll earlier, uh, a lot of people were talking about the lack of uh, guidance. And it, it's no surprise that we pointed out to the Department of Education a few years ago that there is no provision for career guidance in special schools. We believe that's a serious omission. Um, and as a, as a consequence of that, we developed this supported transition program that's aimed at supporting young people from special schools. We're partnered in three special schools, uh, two in County Loud and St. Augustine's in uh, South Dublin here, where Scott and Killian both attended. And we have a careers and employment facilitator based in the school, and they work with the students for the last two years of school, uh, helping them to develop a really ambitious transition plan. And then for those who decide they want to go on to the mainstream into further education, training and employment, that same facilitator works with them for three years after school. For those who decide they need to and want to go to a disability service, they will leave with a well-developed transition plan and hopefully that that service will then help them to, to realize that plan. Um, the Real Walk Real Ability Project is for people who have come to the Walk service, like I suppose Scott and Killian. And what it allows us to do is to recruit uh, professional job coaches and vocational skills trainers who work with the participants through our partner site. So we, we partner with a lot of employers 
Um, so, for example, we would have a, a person working with the, the participants in our Tyler Hospital project. We have another project uh, that we share with, with CARE in, in Leinster House called the uh, Rock to Work and Learn project. We have a partnership with Airfield Estate and then with many, many employers around the place. So essentially that project is really about you've left school, you say you want to have a job, you want to have a career. Well, here are the people that can help you do that while you're working on the other pieces of your of your life plan as well. OK, so these two programs are grounded in the in the in the principles, the core principles of supported employment. And I, and I think it's important uh, to talk about that today, because th this, this is what keeps us on the straight and narrow, really. Um, and when I mentioned earlier, I think sometimes people start in the wrong place. I think th this is what keeps us going in the in the right place. And we find that this is what makes the difference. So the, the first stage is, is client engagement. So when we meet the young person for the first time, really are important to help the young person build some trust and, and figure out, you know, what they like, what they want, what their interests are, who, who they are, um, and realize some things about themselves. Now that, that can take a, a bit of time. And there's a lot of different activities, a lot of different ways that we would support that. The second stage then is, we call it vocational profiling. And this is important young person to figure out what they're good at and where their skills, talents, and interests lie that might best fit into the world of work. So we begin to focus a little bit more about, about um, um, the type of things that you need, the skills that you would need for being in work um, and, and to get into work and to stay in work. So the third stage then really is the job finding piece. The, ne the next stage is really helping you to connect your skills, talents, interests into what might be job opportunities and where might we find those and what type of employers and how long do you want to work per week and all of that sort of stuff that's around work. At that point, you would have a fair idea of what would excite you in a job and what might best fit. And only then would we engage an employer. And I think this is where I, I was talking earlier about, I think where people might start the in the wrong place. I think a lot of time people start with, I have an employer who says he'll give a job to somebody and then try and squeeze somebody into that job. We much prefer to work the other way with the person. You figure out where you want to go. We'll help you figure out where those opportunities might be. And then we will go and help you pursue that. So finding the employers who will give an opportunity to somebody, whether it's a job sampling uh, event, whether it's a work experience or whether it's a job, um, that's kind of a really important stage. And uh, we spend a lot of time on that as well. And then the last piece of it is a lot of, look at a lot of us will always have a bad day in work every now and again. Um, we might be working a long time. It's good to have a colleague or somebody who can you can turn to and say, I'm having a bad day. Um, what do you think I might do with this? Or I don't know how to do this, or I don't know how to do that. This on and off work support is really, really important. Um, there's a tendency to think that you can withdraw support completely. Um, and uh, when somebody is in a job and everything is sorted, but, but we find that there's always an ongoing conversation. So we're there when we're needed, we're not when we're not. Uh, we don't get in the way of it. Um, we just want to make sure that everybody knows that this is a process and an ongoing process. To tie that in, I suppose, today with in terms of, of post-school and the journey from leaving school, um, this is probably the way we would think about it a lot of the time. It's like a, a career journey and it ties in with the supported employment model. So initially, again, that first piece that you must know yourself and the better you know yourself, the better uh, you'll be able to make decisions. The second piece, which uh, I presume there's family members and some young people on today, is really about exploring possibilities. Um, really important part of this. For us, we would see this more as a, as a filtering process, uh, you know, um, making a decision whether you think something is, is for you or not, uh, connecting, making a list of the things that you like or that are of interest to you, that fit and suit you, and, and disregarding the ones that don't, because they're, they're no use to you. Um, while we would love to think that every single opportunity in the country is open to all of us, that's just not reality. Uh, we're all different. Um, so it's about finding the options that are good and right for you and ignoring the rest of them. The third part is where we would spend a lot of time, particularly on the peer program with the young people in school, is planning that way forward, mapping that out, 
you've said you wanted to do this. This is how you might go about it. Let's go and have a conversation. Let's go and see the place. Let's go and talk to the people. So if I if I was leaving school and I wanted to have a job in an office, for example, if I, if I take the Trinity example and Mark's example, I would really like to map that journey out before I had left school. I would love to know where I'm going to be in September of this year. If I want to go, if I feel I need to go to a service, I think I really want to be bringing that plan to the service and asking the services, who can help me with this? And how do you do that? Um, I, would be, I would be very strong in asking services, can you help me with this or not? Uh, and seeing what they say. And then the last part of it is making it happen. I suppose when you leave school, a lot of people uh, end up in a bit of a in a bit of a void over the summer. That's where our peer program kicks in when the school finishes and the young person has a plan. And if it's about going to mainstream further education or a job, our facilitators are there all summer working on that. It's not like uh, when school closes that 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 um, we close. And then I suppose to, to finish this off, we're finishing off at the start of the journey. And uh, the advice is. It, if you don't know where you're going, how do you know when you get there? So we would always suggest that people have a destination in mind. And it doesn't matter where it is. It doesn't matter who thinks it's a good idea. It doesn't matter if it's going to take years to do. The main thing is that it's something that excites you. So the first time we would meet young people, the first question we ask them is, what's your dream job? And Mark said that a few times there. He talked about in VY, his dream job was to work in an office. Uh, and uh, it, it, it sounds like something that excited Mark as he went along. But for us, it, it, we see people's motivation really hold firm when there's, a, when there's a destination in mind that excites them. So, for example, Claire, her dream job was to work in a coffee shop. Claire is working in a coffee shop. In fact, she has two jobs. She's furloughed from one and she's working another at the weekends. Brian's dream job was to be a professional footballer or a jockey or working with animals. So it was a little bit, a little bit ambiguous, but Brian's now working in Woody's. So he hasn't quite got the dream job that he thought about, but he's working in a job that he really, really likes. That doesn't mean he won't achieve his dream job down the road. Neve, his dream job was childcare, and she finished QQI level uh, five course in childcare just recently and is working in a cafe while the pandemic is there. And she is planning and hoping in September to be in a job in a creche. She always she has had paid employment before in a creche as part of her course. And Ross's dream job was to be a professional, a personal trainer. But Ross is now working in Tala Hospital. But the point being that it mightn't always be you might not always get the dream job as such. Uh, but we say shoot for the stars and you might hit the moon. Be ambitious and have a go. So that's walk and that's our approach. We're very lucky to be able to access funding outside of the HSE to allow us to do this. And um, I suppose from here, it's probably the best thing to do is maybe ask Scott, maybe to tell us what his dream job is and maybe uh, tell us a little bit about himself and tell his story. Is that okay, Scott? You okay for that? Yeah. Can you see that okay? Good, all good. I'll leave it to you now. Thank you. My, my real life training. Journey. My name is Scott Mates. On age 22, I went to St. Augustine's Black Rock, started and walked in September 2017. I'm currently in my fourth year in real life training program. I was Pierce College studying soccer coaching and gym instruction QQI level 5. Worked part time in Regatta Great Outdoors ILAC. My first year in walk, I done a journey to walk program in Bally Firm Library and I done a wellbeing program. I was also part of Walk's pub quiz in the LNR pub in Walkinstown. I also done some volunteering with Walk giving out water to Martin Runners. Job site visits. The job site visits I went down with Walk is to Fleet Maddox and Halle and sports call gym in Ring's End. Walk experience. My first walk experience was with walk in the Green Kitchen Cafe in 2017, then walk experience with Lord Celtic Football Club Academy as part of my per course in Pierce College. Dublin 
Dublin South East Community Training Centre study arts and recreation from 20, September 2018 to September 2019. I started in Hearst College in September 2019 when currently studying soccer coaching and gym instruction QQI level 5. Part time job I started working in Regatta Grey Outdoors in the Oilac Centre in Dublin in July 2020. Thanks, Scott. That's that's yeah, your yeah. journey. That's your journey so far. Okay, just a quick one. Uh, July 2020, you started working in the ILAC last summer when the pandemic was on. Is that true? Yeah. And and did you get any training before you went in there to work in in with like the got, COVID? I trained like a few months, a few weeks before. Okay. You didn't just go in there and start working without any training. No. Okay. Good man. Thanks for that. No. Uh, Killy, and you're up. Uh, hi, I'm Killian, and welcome to my story. Um, so I'm from Walkerstown. I'm 22 years old. Um, I'm a fourth year student in Walker's Real Life Training Program. Um, yeah, you can go next, I suppose. I don't know. Um, before I started in Walk, um, I went to St. Augustine's in Black Rock. Um, there I did a VTAC QQI level three. Um, yeah, you can go next. What I've done uh, since starting a walk, so I've done things like, uh, I've been doing a lot of work experience. Uh, I was doing some in the green kitchen as waiting staff. Uh, I also done some in Martex electronic shop for repairs. Um, and then I had uh, one day a week working at a uh, mace. Um, and then I also did some with IT school support as a technician uh, assistant. Um, and now I work at Facebook uh, training for uh, IT help desk, working uh, 30 hours per week. Uh, that's me and uh, Mace. <laughs> Was it fair to say that wasn't your favourite job? No, yeah, it's fair, yeah. <laughs> Uh, what I want, would like for the future, uh, I'd love to develop my career at Facebook because uh, I'm really enjoying it and want to get better at IT skills. Uh, I've passed my driving test, so uh, I want to get a new car that obviously I like. Um, I would like to obviously uh, continue my career at Facebook and make more money so I can make uh, good choices. Uh, and also to live independently um, or own a boat in Grand Canal docks because housing renting is just too expensive. Thanks, Killian. Thank uh, you. Yeah, thanks. So, that's us, short and sweet. So lovely. Thank you very much. Your um, your journeys are very important. Um, they inspire and give people ideas of what's possible. So thank you very much. A couple of the questions that have come in so far are around that process of dreaming and, and daring to dream. So I wonder, Scott or, or Killing, could you talk about that process? Was it easy? Was it difficult? What supports were helpful, maybe? Uh, well, pretty much I always wanted to work in IT because um, I love tech. So I knew I always wanted to do that. So I started by um, doing some work experience with... Um, IT school support in, uh, he goes around to different schools and, uh, you know, switches the tech for them. And then I was doing one in, um, in, in walk with the IT guy. So I suppose I just kept on doing them until uh, I just built up enough experience. And then the job in uh, Facebook came available and I just went for the interview and then obviously I got it, so. And Scott? Yeah. In terms of your dreaming and where did you find support, you know, for making your decisions? I just done like a lot of work experience, like in like working with dealing with customers and I like, don't work experience with the like, game, the green kitchen. That's how I probably got the job going in with that because it's dealing with customers. And I also done like a paid, paid appointment with. In a hardware in, in Germany. 
Liam's hardware done a nightly placement there. So it sounds like you, you accepted all the opportunities that came your way and they led to more opportunities. Yeah. Yes. Lots of compliments coming in here um, for the two of you, especially Scott and Killian, uh, for sharing your story here this morning. Very uh, inspired um, by your decision making and your process uh, and, uh, and talking with us this morning about the process. Uh, we do have a question here for Des, a few questions in regards to the program itself. Um, are there ways in which families or parents um, can push uh, these types of other opportunities to other parts of the country? Yes, <laughs> very straight. I think, I think the more parents uh, get together uh, and see what's happening in other parts of the country and asking why can't we have that here? and call your local TD and ask, why can't we have it in here? And all those things, I'm afraid, that's what you have to do. And, and it's, it's, it's sad and it's not right. Uh, hopefully the, the implementation of the UNCRPD will deal with some of that. But if, if, uh, if I was in a position and I have a son or daughter coming to 15, 16, 17 years of age, I'd be asking those questions now and I wouldn't be waiting around. How about in terms, Des, of, of one query here from a participant is around guidance counselling in secondary school as an essential resource. Um, do you find uh, with your participants that they've had any supports in that regard or what can family members do uh, um, to encourage, uh, I suppose, better support in that area? Uh well, I, I suppose it, there's two ways. So our peer programme is partnered with special schools and there is no provision for career guidance in special schools. So that's that's a real gap. Um, our, our peer programme involves career guidance, but it's about support to transition really. So it's, it's much deeper. So a, a career guidance counsellor won't help you get work experience and won't go with you to work experience and won't no negotiate with an employer or they won't go on a visit to a college with you and negotiate with tutors. So our, our peer support program is a much deeper um, support than career guidance. But guidance is a, is, is a process that asks you, you know, the question you asked Scott and Killeen about that dreaming, that process. I mean, if nobody's asking you, what do you want to be when you grow up? How will you ever know? Mm -hmm. And it's, that, it's part of that process uh, is missing. So in a mainstream school, the guidance counsellors will meet in first year and second year and third year and some light conversations around that stuff. It's put on the agenda. Um, our experience of guidance in mainstream schools is, is patchy, to say the least. Uh, we have a call, uh, just started to work with a young lady here in Dublin who's coming from a mainstream school. And the person who's supporting her is our special needs assistant and not the guidance people, the guidance team in the school don't know what to do for her. Mm. That's a real issue as well. So it's like, it seems to be, if it's outside of the CAO, we don't seem to know what other options are there. And that that's not good enough either. So yeah. uh, I'm not making any apologies for being direct about this stuff because that's the way we, that these are the stories we are hearing. So we find ourselves having to scrape money to other departments and pilot projects and pilot projects and pilot projects to fill gaps in the system. And uh, that's just, it's sad, but if I was a parent, I wouldn't be waiting around uh, for, for things to change. I'd be making calls and demanding change. Yeah, the demanding <laughs> is key, is key. Yeah, yeah. frustrating, uh, but it, it's, it's unfortunately what, what we have to do. Indeed, and it provides a good model. Uh, yours is one, your ability program is one of, is it 29? 20, 27, 27. 27 models um, across Ireland. And uh, so there may be something in the area that some of our participants are in. If you look up the ability program, um, there's more compliments coming in here, flooded with compliments. Um, excellent, Scott and Killian, uh, wishing you best of luck. Um, um, in terms of finding jobs, Des, we'll make this just our final question. I know we're near to our hour, but in terms of finding jobs, what is the difficulty level in finding jobs for the people that you support? Uh, I, I, does that, is that, that question I'm going to presume is that asking, uh, finding and engaging employers uh, yes. is probably yes. what's meant in that employers. question. Employers, 
Okay, so it, it, on a scale of one to 10, the engaging employers piece for us is at a difficulty level of approximately three. So it's relatively low. And, and that's because when we approach an employer, we are doing it specifically in, with, with somebody in mind that, will, that has already identified that type of work, that type of environment. And we think this employer is a match. So we don't know who the employers are. So for example, when, when Killian came to us and he's always been very strong in his desire to be involved in working in IT and tech, he had that very strong sense. At that time, we didn't know we were going to end up speaking to Facebook, but it was on the agenda. So the conversation with Facebook probably has taken a year to come to fruition before Killian ends up in the job. But, but it, it's easier, again, it goes back to the destination. If you know where you want to go, it's easier to plan and get there. So, for, so our approach to the engaging employers is always about the person first and where they've identified and where we all come up with a plan and we find that that then works. Because when we approach the employer, we have a very, very defined ask. Uh, we make it very easy and we support it all the way. So we take a lot of the risk and fear and uncertainty out of it. So it's, uh, while I'd say it's a relatively simple process for us, it's not easy, but we enjoy it and we're good at it. And we, we will target any employer depending on what the person wants. So we're not afraid to go and speak to foreign direct investment companies or the local hardware, as Scott mentioned earlier, Liam's hardware, I think had two employees, Scott, I think before you joined. I mean, it, it's, it's the same conversation. It's some of, the, some of the bigger organizations who have a lot of HR processes. So for example, um, you know, we, we, we had a young man recruited by Accenture last year, and a lot of process had to change in their recruitment to facilitate that. But so be it. Once we're on the journey, once we're getting there, Katria, that's that's the thing. So engaging employers, mm -hmm. I would say it's it's um, if you're doing it well and doing it right, it's not as difficult as people make it out to be. Engage, engage, have the courage. I'd like yeah. to ask Mark and Marie to join us, please. And uh, in closing, I just want to, again, applaud everyone from all of the 150 plus attendees over the hour uh, for your uh, contributions this morning. Uh, although brief, um, hopefully it's given all of our participants today an idea uh, that they can follow up on um, in terms of working to progress uh, better supports for employment um, for, for people in Ireland. Um, I want you to know as well, participants, that we have one more in this series next Tuesday morning, uh, which will look at uh, further community supports and know that on our Inclusion Ireland YouTube channel, all of these videos will sit if someone didn't get a chance to participate today. So thank you, uh, Marie and Mark, uh, Scott, Killian, and Des for your contributions today. Bye. Thank Much you. Much appreciated. Thank you. All right. Bye, Bye now. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.